Yonkers. We're under the auspices of WJCS and the Yonkers Office for the Aging. We have our resource specialist with us today. Please welcome Alexis Smith. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Alexis Smith, the resource specialist with the Yonkers NORC. If you want to learn more about community resources, benefits, or need referrals, feel free to contact us. Our information will be in the chat. Everybody enjoyed today's program, and I'll send it back over to Valerie. Thanks, Alexis. We have great partners with the Yonkers NORC, one of which is the Yonkers Public Library. The library has three branches, Riverfront, Will, and Crestwood. Please visit your local library. The recording should be on the um, YPL website. If you go to the um, YouTube page, you should be able to search for it that way. Thank you. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce Elisa White Holland, who is our representative from Columbia Presbyterian Hospital. Thank you so much, Valerie. It's always our pleasure to be collaborating with our friends from the Yonkers Nork uh, to bring important, potentially life-saving education to your seniors. And on behalf of the leadership of New York Presbyterian Westchester, I welcome you to today's presentation, Aging and Colon Health in Observance of National Colorectal Cancer Awareness Month, featuring Dr. Joseph Riad. Before we begin, I'd like to tell you a little bit about our speaker. Dr. Joseph Riad is a board certified colon and rectal surgeon with New York Presbyterian Columbia University Irving Medical Center. His area of expertise includes treating the full spectrum of benign and malignant colorectal diseases, including colon and rectal cancer, inflammatory bowel disease, diverticulitis, and pelvic floor conditions. Dr. Riyad is also experienced in robotic surgery. He earned his medical degree with highest honors from Cairo University School of Medicine in Egypt, which was followed by a general surgery residency at Cairo University Hospital. He then finished a surgical internship at USC in Los Angeles, followed by a general surgery residency at New York Medical College. Please welcome Dr. Joseph Riyad. Well, thank you for having me and thank you for this introduction. Um, I'm honored to be with you guys. I'm going to present today aging and colon health, uh, what you need to know. I don't have any uh, disclosures for this presentation. Um, I uh, kind of tried to figure out what is important to know. Uh, so I split it, divided it into seven points. I think this is the mainly what you need to know about the colon and colon disease and how to keep your colon healthy. So the first point was, what is the colon exactly? Uh, what does the colon do? What is the source of energy for the colon and the colonic cells? Uh, how do you know that you have an unhealthy gut? Um, how to try to keep your colon as healthy as possible? What are the red flags to, that you should be cautious about and careful when you find them? Uh, and some common diseases of the colon, there's a, a ton of colon diseases, so we just focus on the ones that we need to know about. So what is the colon exactly? The colon is a synonym of um, large intestine. So uh, it's about 150 centimeters, which is about around five feet. And this is the distal, the, the last portion of our gut. Our gut starts with the mouth, the esophagus, the stomach, and then the small intestine, which is the longest part, and then ends up with the colon. Uh, and as I said, it's about 150, but varies from one person to another. And this is the part, the diagram shows you the parts of the colon. It starts with the cecum, which is on the right side, and you can see here the appendix attached to it. And then the right colon, which is the ascending colon, the transverse colon, descending colon, sigmoid colon, and then the last 15 centimeters is called the rectum and the anus where we uh, uh, pass uh, uh, stool. So what does the colon do exactly? What is the function of the colon? Uh, the small intestine mainly is for absorption of the nutrients. Uh, whatever food that we eat, the small intestine absorbs all of the nutritional part that we need. The, um, the minerals, the vitamins, the proteins, the carbs, the function of the colon is a little bit different. So the colon mainly absorbs the water 
of what comes out of the small intestine absorbs most of the water. It makes the stool more, um, uh, the consistency firmer. And then um, uh, also uh, secretes salt in it, uh, sodium and chloride, and propagate the stool uh, to the anus so that we can defecate. Um, stool production, it's about, it varies, of course, every person and depends on how much food you eat, but it average 128 grams a day. And of course, the more fiber that you eat, the more volume that you're gonna um, have. The diet affects the composition and the pH of, um, of the stool. And that's why diet is very important. What we eat affects what passes through the colon. And the interesting part that I didn't know before medical school, actually, that half of our stool is not the food or the fiber, it's the bacteria. So about 50% of our stool is the bacteria the, the, the biogenome that we have within the colon is excreted with the, with the stool. So that's about 25 to 50%, which is an interesting uh, thing to know. Um, as I said, the, the, the colon receives about a liter and a half, two liters of fluid coming out from the small intestine after it absorbs the nutrients over a period of 24 hours. And then only about 100 uh, of fluid is left within it. What is the source of energy to the colon itself? Uh, as I said, uh, after the nutrients are, are absorbed, some of the stool passes through mainly with water. So that's the interesting part. When we eat fiber, so the car carbs in the fiber, the, the, the carbs uh, that pass through the, the, the fiber that we eat, the vegetables, the fruits, and the bacteria on the colon wall, as you can see here in the diagram, uh, um, kind of metabolize it and then forms what's, sh what's called short chain fatty acids. It's um, a molecule, six carbons, uh, and those fatty acids like butyrate are the source of energy to the cell. They go inside the cells and they form ATP, which is the energy source of the colon cells to keep it healthy. And then what's left and not used is passed to the liver to form glucose, cholesterol, fatty acids, and part of the energy of the body itself. So the, the vegetables and fruits are actually the source of energy to our colon. And this is the th kind of carb that you want to eat so that you can keep your colon as healthy as possible. What are the signs of an unhealthy gut? Like when, when do you know that your colon and your bowel is not healthy? Uh, bloating, flatulence all the time, um, constipation uh, for a long period of time, diarrhea for a long period of time that don't resolve quickly, uh, feeling fatigued all the time, lack of energy, a lack of concentration, loss of concentration, like brain fog, headaches, migraines, um, you've, you're eating less and less food, but you can't lose weight. That's a sign also that your gut is not very healthy. Skin problems and autoimmune diseases can be caused by an unhealthy gut. So what we eat affects our gut, which affects our whole body. If you keep uh, your colon unhealthy, your whole body will be unhealthy. So what is the part that we can play to keep our colon healthy? Um, and it's difficult with age. It's difficult nowadays in this era because the main thing is the diet. As I said, what you eat is the most important thing. And now we're bombarded by a lot of food that is unhealthy. It's everywhere. It's cheaper. Um, it's the cheaper options uh, that we have in the markets, but it's not the healthiest thing. So you have to try as much as possible to eat, to eat a healthy, high fiber diet. And this should be your day-to-day -day diet. Um, an example to this is Mediterranean diet, which depends more on uh, white meats and um, olive oil and vegetables and fruits. So this is a kind of a, a healthy diet. You have to eat at least 30 grams of fiber per day. It varies between men and women, but average is 30 grams, which we don't get mostly from our food. So I always tell my patients, eat a lot of vegetables and fruits, try to depend most of the day on that kind of uh, 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 food. But most of the time, you're not going to get the 30 grams. So I personally take fiber supplements a day, which is psyllium husk. It's a fiber. There are different brands. You can get it from any pharmacy uh, in powder form. You can do a scoop or two a day and drink it with lots of water. This will supplement. Every scoop is about seven grams. So it can help you add 
more fiber to your diet. And if you do this routinely every day, your stool is going to be bulky but soft and it's going to pass easy and then your, your colon is going to be healthier. Try to minimize red meats as much as possible. I always say in moderation, like you can't, if you can and you don't like red meats, that's better. But if you um, if you depend on red meats a lot in your diet, try to minimize it. Once a week or maybe max twice a week is enough. Don't make it a day-to-day -day thing eating red meats. It's not healthy. And it can cause, it has higher risk of having uh, cancer also. Smoked meats are not healthy. So uh, the smoking process of red meats makes it unhealthy too to the colon and the cells. And processed foods in general, which is a lot nowadays, but processed foods is not healthy to eat at all. Um, and as I said, Mediterranean diet or low FODMAT diet is one of uh, the kinds of diet that are uh, are good in general. Um, it's healthy. It keeps your weight in a, in a good range and it supplies your colon with a lot of fiber. You have to drink a lot of water uh, every day. And I say two to three liters of a day, which is about more than 10 glasses a day. So we have to keep track of that because we drink coffee, we drink sodas, that don't count. Nothing of that counts. It has to be actual water. And if you take a lot of fiber and you don't drink enough water, it's not going to work well. You're going to be bloated. You're going to be having spasms. You're not going to feel well. So always drink a lot of water with it. Exercise helps a lot. Exercise helps your colon to propagate and function well. Uh, exercise helps with constipation, uh, even walking for 30 minutes a day. And exercise has, has proven that it lowers uh, having colon polyps and uh, diverticulitis and diverticular disease. So exercise, at least 20, 30 minutes walking is very important. Avoid smoking, and that's for every single kind of uh, uh, cancer. Smoking is a, a big contributor. If you smoke every day, you're high risk for every single type uh, of cancer. And minimize alcohol. Uh, if you can stop it, completely stop it. Alcohol has shown it can cause the gut to be unhealthy and it can cause colon cancer too. There is high hazard ratio with drinking a lot of alcohol. So in, in moderation also. Um, for me, I felt probiotics, especially if it's 80 billion or 100 billion help with your gut flora. We all have bacteria lining the gut, the microbiome, and those what what we call like the good bacteria, and those are the ones that help to process the fiber that I talked about and the carbohydrates, and gives the energy to our cells. So sometimes because of taking antibiotics or not eating healthy, the the gut flora itself changes and changes from good bacteria to bad bacteria and then you will have like spasm and pain and colics and distension and bloating probiotics help to replenish the, the the gut itself with those good bacteria especially the ones with high volume of those bacteria the high billion counts so i personally take once a day probiotics and it, it does help if you don't need antibiotics don't take them um, antibiotics has a lot of uses. It's important in certain situations, but um, especially in some cultures, anytime you're sick, you take antibiotics. Uh, that's not correct because it affects the, as I said, the bacteria and the flora of the gut itself and changes it and causes resistance and then can cause a lot of uh, unhealthy cells in the gut itself and the colon. So what are the red flags that you should be aware of and not get concerned, but seek help when you when you uh, like have them? Persistent bleeding. Um, and that's a problem that we see a lot in a lot of patients. Uh, a lot of patients come to us and say, oh, I've been having bleeding from hemorrhoids for 10 years and so forth, or for five years, um, but it's getting worse. You shouldn't wait that long because it could be something else other than the hemorrhoids. Um, so when you have bleeding that stays for a long time, if you're taking care of the cause that you think is the source of the bleeding, um, and it still is there, you should see somebody. Even if you had a colonoscopy two, three years ago, you still should see a, a, a physician. Um, abdominal pain. If you're having persistent abdominal pain for a long period of time, you should see somebody. That That's a, a red flag also. Uh, the stool itself, if you notice that the stool caliber is narrow, you should see somebody. Um, change in bowel movements, constipation or diarrhea or alternating constipation and diarrhea, because there is a lot of causes of this, including irritable bowel syndrome. 
but there are other causes also that uh, are more dangerous. So if it's if you always have like a, a, a change in your bowel movements, it's not regular, or if you have diarrhea that stays for more than 10 weeks or constipation more than 10 weeks, although you're taking suicide, you should see somebody. Loss of weight. If you're eating fine and there is no change in your diet and you're still losing weight, um, you should see your physician, your PCP. Uh, loss of appetite that is unexplained. Any family history of cancer or polyps that makes you see somebody sooner than later. Uh, iron deficiency anemia, and that's an important thing. Like sometimes uh, patients would come and say, oh, I've been having iron deficiency anemia for a year now. Um, you should see somebody and get a colonoscopy because you should get checked. You have to make sure that we know the source of this anemia uh, because it could be cancer too. So don't say I just have anemia. You have to figure out what is the cause of it. Now the common diseases of the colon um, and there is a, a huge amount of diseases and pathologies it needs hours and hours to talk about. But I decided to choose those two because I feel like those are the, the one of the common ones and the important ones. So, uh, and if there is anything else that anybody wants to ask about, we can talk about later also. So I decided to choose the um, diverticular disease and colon cancer. So diverticular disease, it's a common pathology. It's, um, and um, as I always tell my patients, 80% of patients that have diverticular disease don't even know that they have diverticular disease. Like I can have diverticular disease right now and I don't know that I have it. Um, as you see in the diagram, I found that this is a nice diagram to show you that two different things, the two different pathologies um, of diverticular disease. As you see on the left side here in the descending colon, you see those bubbles, those pouches. This is diverticular disease. It means that, that the layers of the colon, there are three layers, one of them pouched outside, outside the, the muscle layer. So those are the outpouching of the colon and it happens because of constipation and aging. But this is not a, this is not something that will cause you by itself any issues. Like you can have it, but if it's not inflamed, you might not even know that you have it. And we see it a lot in scopes and it doesn't cause the patient anything. The bottom part here, as you can see in the sigmoid colon, this is the inflammation of those pouches. It's called diverticulitis. And this is when you start to have symptoms that we're going to talk about. The wall itself becomes inflamed and thickened and cause, can cause constipation and uh, can cause complications. I wanted to give you a picture uh, from what we see in a colonoscopy. So you can see here the scope, the colon wall, and you see those outpouching those holes, holes in the wall, uh, in the wall. Those are the diverticular disease, and we call it ticks, but those are not inflamed. So the patient probably has no symptoms at all. It's one of the most commonly diagnosed uh, condition in the in the gut itself, diverticular disease. And it happens in the colon, not in the rectum. Um, it can happen sometimes in the small bowel, but the commonest part is in the colon itself, especially the left side. Um, it has increased, and especially the, the diseases and the illnesses and the infection from it. Over the past few decades, it has been uh, increasing in prevalence. And uh, this is due to our diet. I'm going to talk to the risk factors also. Um, as I told you, uh, out of 100 patients, 80 uh, will have it and not know. 20 only will have any symptoms or problems from it or diverticulitis. Um, it's more in men than females, male than female, but that doesn't make a difference. Um, regarding diet, I'm going to talk about the fiber, the Western diets. And the myth that was always mentioned like a long time ago, seeds, popcorn, and nuts. Uh, and people used to say, don't eat them. So we'll talk about that too. So what does the study show? I I'm try, try to summarize it as much as possible. Um, they looked at different countries and their diets. So industrial, uh, industrialized Western countries uh, that use Western diet, and Western diet is mainly high in meat and high in uh, red meat, especially, and fat and low in fiber. They found that there is increased prevalence of diverticular disease. So a lot of people have those outpouching and diverticular disease. They also checked on those uh, patients and saw um, what they eat and they compared it with other people that eat a more healthy diet. And they found that um, high intake of fat and red meat 
increases the incidence of, of this disease. Um, it had a, a hazard ratio, so there was higher risk for diverticulitis. So people that ate this kind of diet had a more risk of having a complication from diverticular disease, which is the inflammation, the diverticulitis. Um, they also found that fiber um, is, uh, as we mentioned before, is very important and it makes uh, your gut healthy. But especially from fruits and vegetables is more protective than the fiber that you take from cereal or fiber one or uh, so the fruits and vegetables are healthier and more protective. We always used to say like long time ago, popcorn, nuts and seeds, if you have a bout of diverticulitis or diverticular disease, not to eat them, not to take them, they can cause complications, they can cause the infection to come back, but um, they... Um, uh, one study that looked into that showed no correlation completely on the opposite side. It was more protective to eat those kind of, uh, of uh, seeds and popcorn and nuts. So, um, so it doesn't, it doesn't cause any harm to take those uh, kinds of nuts and seeds. What about age? So, um, Diverticular disease starts in middle age, usually in 40s, 50s, and it rises uh, after that. So the incidence is 5% at age 40, and it reaches up to 80% by age 80. So it's part of aging, and it's part of the change in your diet, too. Um, they found that exercise, that uh, not being sedentary, uh, has uh, has improved the 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 the, the the incidence that you have less incidence of developing diverticular disease. So when you walk, when you exercise, even like 30 day, uh, minutes a day, that lowers the incidence of having diverticular disease and complications from it. Smoking, um, there was a large study that looked at smoking and people, the smokers had three times the risk of having complications from diverticular disease. So the non-smokers had less complications from this. Non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs like ibuprofen, Motrin, uh, Aleve. Um, so those uh, medications you can take, but some people are chronically on it. They take it every day. They take it multiple times a day. And that increases the risk of having diverticular disease and increases the risk of having diverticulitis and complication from diverticulitis. So it's advised not to use this for a long period of time or chronically every single day. Uh, high BMI and obesity, that also increases the risk of having uh, diverticulitis. So if you're healthier, not sedentary, you're exercising, you lose weight, you're eating healthy, there is a less risk of having diverticular disease and diverticulitis. So what are the symptoms of diverticular disease? Diverticular disease itself, as I told you, it, it, uh, you might be asymptomatic completely. You might not even know. But when it becomes inflamed, which is diverticulitis, that's the difference, you start to have symptoms. The most common one, especially in the left side, if you have left-sided diverticulitis, is pain. You would have pain in the left lower quadrant, um, left side of the belly. Uh, that's the, the commonest site of having diverticulitis, although it can happen in any part of the colon, but the commonest site is on the left side in the signal colon. And then when somebody examines you, you're going to have tenderness. Uh, it's going to be uh, painful. Uh, rarely there will be bleeding, although it can happen with the infection at the same time. And then if complicated, it can you can have more severe symptoms. It can form abscesses inside the belly. It can cause perforation. It can cause fistulas with the bladder, with the vagina, with the intestine. And it can become more complex of a disease. Uh, and that can cause you to become sicker. Yes. Uh, and the diagnosis in this case is, um, of course, you, you're, you're going to see a physician or you're going to be in the hospital in the ED if it happens. And uh, labs are going to be drawn. It's gonna, you're going to have like an increased white count. And then the CAT scan, as I showed you a picture here of the thickened part of the colon, and this patient has an abscess, is the way that we diagnose it with, mainly with the CAT scan. So what are the, what are the, the treatment options that we have for diverticul diverticulitis in those cases? It depends on how bad the, 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 the condition is and if it's complicated, if it's not complicated. But the three main um, uh, ways of treating it is medical treatment with antibiotics and even with pain uh, killers, NSAIDs. 
uh, if there is an abscess, you can use radiology to drain it or surgical treatment with surgery. Sorry. But as I said, this depends on how bad the disease is. If it's complicated, if it's not complicated, but if it's uncomplicated, just thickening and inflammation, I usually talk to the patient when they come to the clinic and I tell them that the, the, the studies has shown us certain, um, certain uh, things that we know is true. The first episode, episode is usually the most severe one. So if your first one is uncomplicated, then it's unlikely for you to have the next or the, the second or the third one to be a complicated episode. Um, and that's important for the patient to know uh, that he his first one is likely to be the most severe one that he would have. Um, for uncomplicated cases, we usually only give antibiotics um, and that will take care of it for a week or two and cause the inflammation to subside. And some of those cases don't need to stay in the hospital even. If the patient is healthy, he's not immunocompromised, uh, there is uh, no fevers, the white count is not uh, very high, he can take a course of antibiotics at home and that will take care of it. And uh, even some patients don't even need antibiotics at all. Some of those episodes we treat only with um, uh, Aleve or ibuprofen or Motrin or painkillers without even antibiotics. But still, some surgeons, or actually most surgeons, prefer to give antibiotics still. For the complicated um, ones, it's a little bit different because you will have a, a, a big abscess or you're going to be sick or... And I'm not going to go into this, but I mean, this will, will need surgery either within the same admission or, or within a short period of time. And most of those patients that are uncomplicated and uh, resolve with antibiotics, we tell them most of the time you need to get a colonoscopy in six to eight weeks when the inflammation cools down so that we can make sure that there is no malignancy. Uh, some studies found uh, about two to 5% increase uh, risk of having malignancy with a bout of uh, uh, a diverticulitis, although others showed it's a lower number, but most patients we elect just to do to be on the safe side to get a scope to make sure that there is nothing that we missed. The surgery itself. So the the the, the surgery that we do, um, as I said, it's mainly for complicated, but we, it's individualized for the non-complicated. So if you have a non-complicated diverticulitis and the episode passed away, we did the colonoscopy, it looked fine, and you're feeling okay and it's not affecting your quality of life life then you might not need anything at all. But some patients would have them recur multiple times and it's affecting their quality of life. They would have 10, 12 episodes a year and they say, I can't live like that. So those, it's individualized. We talk with them and we decide together what they want to do. But the surgery is mainly remove the unhealthy parts. And this picture will show you, like if it's a sigmoid diverticulitis, this is the part of the colon that we remove. We go from the rectum which can't have diverticulitis, to the healthy colon, we remove it and then connect it back together. So we remove the source of the, the, the problem itself. And we, most of the surgeons now prefer to do it minimally invasive, either laparoscopically or robotically. Um, this is a picture of the robot itself and how we do it now. There's a lot of advancements right now in, in surgery. Um, but we try to do minimally invasive because the recovery is quicker. You're going to need less pain medications. You stay in the hospital two to three, two to three days and then go home. Um, um, and then you can resume your life very quickly. Um, you don't need like extensive stay in the hospital. You don't need to be out of work for a long day, long time. So it, it helps a lot to do it with very small, tiny holes. Now, colon cancer or rectal cancer, um, and I feel this is important for everybody to know those information. Um, I don't want to scare anybody, but um, it's important because the cancer rates are going up higher even in younger people. So it's important to know th this information. In general, colon rectal cancer is the third most common worldwide cancer and in the U.S. Um, in general. And it's the second uh, most common cause of cancer deaths also worldwide. The mean age of diagnosis, that means for all patients that got colon cancer, men is about 68 and for women is about 72. This changes a little bit with rectal cancer, but average about 68 to 72. The risk factors, and we talked about it a lot. The, the, um, it's a combination of genetic factors, lifestyle, diet, as we said, environmental factors, 
and the microbiome of our gut. Diet, again, we talked about diet a lot today, um, but this is some numbers I wanted to mention to give you an idea. They studied uh, how cancer, um, what affects uh, like forming cancer and diet was a part of it. So colorectal cancer increases by 12% every 100 grams per day increase in intake of red and processed meat. So they studied people that eat red and processed meat and people that don't, and they found out that there's increased 12% of risk of having colorectal cancer with every 100 grams that you increase in your diet of red and processed meat. And it increases 7% for every 10 grams of alcohol intake. So the more alcohol that you drink, the higher the risk that goes up. And it decreases 70% every 90 grams of whole grains. So this is the fiber. When you take more fiber, you don't have to know those numbers, but it gives you an idea. The more fiber that you take, the le you lower the risk of having colorectal cancer. And that was an interesting part, 13% of every 400 grams of dairy. Um, so also like dairy could, could be protected. And as we talked before about the food and the diet and what you need to do to have a healthy gut, certain lifestyle and obesity, has uh, associated with most types of cancer, including colon cancer. So try as much as possible to be active. Um, even walking for 30 minutes a day is more than enough. Walking is is good. You don't have to do something strenuous. It, uh, it should be just limited to 20, 30 minutes and gentle walk is fine. Um, and that showed in one meta-analysis, it was decreased the risk of colorectal cancer by 19%. So almost 20% just by not being sedentary and just having some exercise during your day. So prevention, and that's the important part. And this is why in March it's important that we talk about colon cancer and screening. And we always talk about screening to everybody. Um, the, 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 I'm not going to go through all of the modalities of screening. I'm going to talk about the most common and the most that people do and when to start doing them. Right now, the standard is colonoscopy, and we're going to talk about pros and cons. But recently, in the past couple of years, we have the DNA fit, which is like the Cologuard. If you heard the, this, uh, and some PCPs are, are electing to do it. I'm going to tell you what's important in this uh, to put in consideration what to go for. I, I'm still uh, a strong believer in colonoscopies for the reason I'm going to mention. But the good thing about the Cologuard is you can do it every three years. You don't have to do it um, uh, every year. So um, uh, right now, the guidelines say every three years. Uh, it, it's covered by Medicare. Um, it's sensitive to a colorectal cancer, about 92%. That's a big number. So 92% of the time when you have a colorectal cancer, it's going to detect it. But on the other hand, if you think about it, it can still miss colon cancer. So there is a, a, a false negative numbers. And it's less sensitive if you have a more advanced disease. So which is kind of odd. If you have like a stage four, <laughs> the cologuard is less sensitive. It's expensive. Some insurances don't cover it. Uh, we don't have long-term data on it. Um, and if you have a positive test, you're going to get the colonoscopy in any case. And as I said, they're all false positive rates and false negative rates. The false positive, that means that you uh, will have a, a positive test and we do the colonoscopy and there is nothing there. And the false negative um, means that you have a negative test while you have something in the colon. You would have still a polyp. It's not sensitive to polyps, especially small ones. Uh, and it still can miss cancer. It's not 100%. So even if you have cancer and you do this, it can come back negative. It's not a big number, but still you can miss it. What is the, the, the pros? Why is colonoscopy important? Because it's diagnostic and therapeutic at the same time. When we do the colonoscopy, we can see the lesion. We can see if it's a polyp. If we can see if it's a cancer and take care of it at the same time. Um, it has the highest sensitivity and specificity. So if you have cancer, we'll detect it more than any other test that could be done. Um, and you don't need to do it for a long period of time. If you don't have polyps, it's every 10 years. You don't have to repeat it uh, until the next 10 years. If you have polyps, you're going to tell you uh, how, when you're going to do it. So it might be three years, five years. It depends on the number and the size of those polyps. 
what uh, annoys the people the more, most and the most inconvenient part is the bowel prep, which is uh, the day before the cleansing, because we have to make sure that the colon is clean completely so that we can see. Otherwise, we're going to tell you we have to repeat it again. And that's the, the tough day. You're going to be fasting most of the day, just drinking liquids and taking the bowel, uh, bowel prep and next to the restroom the whole day. Um, it, it can have some complications, though, though most of them are less than 1% of the time. It requires anesthesia, sedation, not general anesthesia, but sedation. Um, and it's expensive, although it's covered for screening pur purposes in most insurances. And I elected to give you a picture so that you have an idea of what we do. Uh, this is the scope, and we put it through the colon, and we have to pass from the left side to the right side, take a look at all of the wall. And if we find a polyp, like this is an example, we take it out. And we send it to pathology. It takes about a week, and then they tell us what it is exactly. Those polyps, what you see there, are the, the, the ones, the lesions that can form cancer in the future. So taking them out will prevent you from having cancer. This is why a colonoscopy is important, because it's also protective. Um, uh, because um, if you have this polyp and you get a cologuard, uh, you, it might be negative, and you leave it. And then within two or three years, it might advance more. So I feel a like colonoscopy is still the gold standard of care. When should we start colonoscopies? That's something also depending on the guidelines. It used to be 50 years, but nowadays we're finding in the last decade more and more younger people getting colon cancer. So it's pushed now to 45 uh, years. And as I said, if there is nothing, it's every 10 years until you reach 75 to 85 years. So by 75, that could be the last one. Um, unless you have polyps, like an example of the lesion that you have here in the diagram, then we'll tell you the pathology, how many of them, how big it is, and we'll tell you when you need to get the next one. If you have a family history, especially a first degree family uh, with colon or rectal cancer, that puts you on a, on a higher uh, risk of go getting those polyps or cancers. So you might need to get your scope earlier. Um, we start at 40 years or 10 years before the age of diagnosis of your family member. So that puts you at an earlier time to start your colonoscopies. And then we follow you up closer, closely than 10 years. It's every five years at least. So what are the signs and symptoms of colon cancer? How do you diagnose it? How do you... Those are the red flags that we discussed um, in the previous slide, the red flags. It's mainly the same thing. Abdominal pain uh, that is persistent, that doesn't go away, that comes uh, very often. Uh, bleeding. Um, and this part is the part of the iron deficiency anemia. Some people have anemia and don't know why they have it and they don't get tested, they don't get scopes. If you have iron deficiency anemia, you should get a colonoscopy just to check and an upper endoscopy also to check on your stomach. Any change in your bowel ha habits that persistent, like we all get sometimes constipated or have diarrhea, but it goes away. But if it keeps coming back, that could be a sign that there is something wrong. Again, the caliber of the stool, if you notice it's becoming like pencil thin, that's a sign that there might be something wrong. Also, you have to seek medical advice. And then when you come with those symptoms, what is a colorectal surgeon or gastroenterologist going to do? Um, this is the workup that we do. Uh, and I'm not going to discuss uh, rectal cancer because it's more extensive and a little bit different, the pathology and what we do exactly. But in general, this is what we do. We do a colonoscopy. It's a diagnostic, as we mentioned. We go inside, take a look and get biopsies and send it to pathology so that we can have an idea what is that mass. CAT scan is very important. We scan the whole body, chest, abdomen, and pelvis, and then it shows us if there is any lesion or a mass that could be concerning, and an MRI for the rectal cancer. And then we discuss uh, multidisciplinary with all, um, all physicians um, in a tumor board, and then we discuss what's the, 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 the plan of care for that specific patient. And I'm not gonna go into detail here, but the treatment is either surgery, and I said we try to do it minimally invasive as much as possible for early recovery and less pain. And we can give before the surgery chemotherapy, immunotherapy, we can give radiotherapy before, for rectal cancer. And then after the pathology, we can give adjuvant treatments uh, after that. 
and everything is tailored towards the patient, their stage, and what they have exactly. So that's why a tumor board is very important in a tertiary center, that we all sit together, the oncologist, the radiation oncologist, the pathologist, and then we see everything. We see the imaging, we see the pathology, and then we decide what fits uh, whom. Thank you. That's all I have. And I'm open for any questions. Thank you, Dr. Riyadh. And um, that was a wonderful, comprehensive um, educational program you just um, gave us. And I want to uh, remind everyone to please post your questions in the chat. We will take those as time allows. Um, I do have a few questions for you, Dr. Riyadh. Um, and I wanted to first ask you a little bit about something you said earlier in terms of we should get 30 grams of fiber a day. Um, help us understand what that looks like. Is that eating uh, legumes once a day, twice a day? Uh, what does that look like on a plate and in what types of foods we should um, have? So I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. I, I was guilty myself not knowing what food uh, exactly is high in fiber. Like I always know vegetables are high in fiber, but I found out after having, um, I have from a nutritionist actually, and that we can help anybody with that to get those resources. Um, uh, one of the nutritionists, I asked them for um, um, uh, like all of the foods and their nutrition, uh, 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 the nutrition components of them and the fiber amount of each uh, gram of those um, uh, fruits and vegetables. And they gave me, and I found something that was amazing for me. Like for example, black berries. Black berries is really high on fiber. It has seven grams of fiber. So there are, we always say vegetables and fruits, especially green vegetables, but uh, there are nutritional like sheets that you can get that can guide you. Um, berries are very high, uh, spinach, of course, broccoli, all of that are very high in fiber. And, and now I have an idea when I look at it, I see, okay, a cup of blackberries, I can get seven grams of, uh, of fiber from it. Uh, but as I said, most of our diet will not make you reach that number. I, I feel like even if you eat, unless you're completely vegetarian, you eat like salad every day and a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of grains, it's really tough with most people diet to reach that number. So I usually supplement it, as I mentioned, with a psyllium husk, which is a fiber supplement, so that I can add to it between 10 to 12 grams so that with a salad a day and some fruit, you can reach that number. Thank you. We have a question in the chat. Um, can you explain the difference between complicated and uncomplicated diverticulitis and who determines this? So, yeah, uh, that's an important question. So uncomplicated means that your colon or the, or the part that had divert diverticular disease became inflamed, but it didn't form an abscess. It didn't perforate. It didn't form a fistula. Uh, those are the, the complications. Uh, an abscess, a stricture, a fistula, a perforation. And when you have that, you're sicker. And how we find out, mainly of the CAT scan and your symptoms. Thank you. What is mucoid plaque and how does that affect us? And ultimately, how do we get rid of it? Mucoid plaque? Uh, somebody like... Um... They have to describe it more. I've never heard of mucoid plaque in the colon? Yes, in the gut. Um, I have not heard of a mucoid plaque. No plaque in the gut. Okay. All right. Well, here's another question. What if you are on certain medications that may cause constipation? What can you do to ease that, particularly since you don't want the colon to work too hard? Um, let me, uh, ask, so they're asking if they're on stool softeners and laxatives? No, some other medication that may have a complication like constipation that may result in complication, not a stool softener, yeah. but a, some medication they're prescribed that might in fact um, have a side effect that causes constipation. What can they do to alleviate that? So the, the, if the drug is necessary and you can't switch it with anything else, you can't lower the, the, the amount that you take from it. Then as we mentioned, fiber, water, a lot of water, a lot of fiber, and then start with taking stool softeners and laxatives. And there's a huge list of 
uh, over-the-counter medications that you can get, including Miralax, milk of magnesia, Cole, Senna. I don't like patients to be on it for a long period of time, but I always tell them on and off. Take it for a couple of weeks and then stop. And then if you're constipated again, start it again. But mainly fiber, water, exercise, and then adding the stool softeners. And you can start with one and add another one until you pass easily. Your stool is bulky but soft and it passes easily. And then for the stool softeners and laxatives, always take a break. Don't keep taking it forever. Thank you. What causes a lot of gas and constricted stools? So as I said, a lot of gas and flatulence is a sign of an unhealthy gut. So it's lack of good diet. It's an unhealthy diet, lack of good fiber amount, not eating enough water. The gut bacteria itself, the microbiome of the gut is not healthy. It has changed. Um, and also, if it's persistent for a long period of time, you must sure that you make sure that you have a colonoscopy to make sure that there is nothing else going on. But to fix that, you have to do what we mentioned, how to make your gut healthy. That slide, and I can get it back. I think my... Uh... While you're looking for that, Dr. Riyadh, um, you had talked about anemia and, you know, while your doctor may say your blood work uh, shows you're anemic, you're saying it's really important to find out what's causing that. So is that something that could have a, um, I guess the question is, how do you determine what is causing anemia? What are some of the tests that a doctor can perform to figure out What's triggering that? So usually if there is iron deficiency anemia, they're going to send um, blood tests that check what's uh, the shape of the cells. It's called the peripheral smear. Uh, they're going to send um, iron studies. But I mean, to check the cause of the anemia itself, if you have iron deficiency anemia, part of it is important to know that you're not bleeding from somewhere because bleeding itself from a cancer or an ulcer or anything like that can cause iron deficiency anemia. So in those cases, you have to make sure that you get an upper endoscopy and a colonoscopy. You have to check that there is no masses, no tumors. There is no source of bleeding. Just don't say I have anemia and that's it. Uh, especially if you're above 50 years old, you should get checked um, because you could be missing something. Uh, it shouldn't be taken lightly. And some patients come to us, unfortunately, saying, oh, I have hemorrhoids for the longest period of time, and it's been bleeding, and uh, uh, I have iron, uh, iron deficiency anemia, and I've been dealing with it for a year or two. This is not right. So you can miss a lot of, and you can come late because of that. Don't put it on something while you're not sure. Always get scoped to make sure that there is nothing else going on. If you get scoped and the gastroenterologist tell you there's nothing in there, then you're fine. It could be something else. It could be the hemorrhoids. It could be a medication that you're taking. It could be just deficiency in your diet. But make sure that it's not something more dangerous. You know, Dr. Riyadh, I, I know you're going to get back to your, this slide, but I, I do want to just um, get your guidance around um, what happens when you see your doctor for your annual physical? You know, most people, as you said, some people can be asymptomatic. They don't know anything is wrong. Um, and I think probably a certain generation of us rely on the doctor to say, oh, you should be getting a colonoscopy or you need an upper endoscopy. Um, would you recommend that we, if we don't hear that from our primary care physician, that we say, hey, I'm X years old, I'm 69 years old, should I be also getting an upper endoscopy since I have been anemic? I'm just wondering how much should we be advocating for ourselves because our doctors may not flag that for us necessarily. Yeah, uh, it's true. Um, and uh, unfortunately, that's that's part of the, the medical knowledge in a community. Like you have to know and read more. Uh, and this is why those presentations and those meetings that we're having are important to educate more and have more knowledge about your body and about the guidelines and what we're finding in our population. Like, as I said, right now we're finding more uh, younger people, uh, 30 years old with colon cancer. It's increasing in prevalence. So those are trends that happen and we're trying to figure out 
what's causing them and change our recommendation and guideline based on that. And then the important part is to inform the population about, about that so that they have the knowledge itself. And it, it's part of the duty of the physician or the primary care doctor that he knows this, what needs to be screened if you're having such and such, what you need to do. So it's partly that uh, on them too. But if you feel like you have something and you have this knowledge, like I told you, if you have iron deficiency anemia and you never got scoped, you should go to your doctor and tell them, should I get an upper endoscopy and a colonoscopy? Although I don't have any symptoms, but I need to check if there is something causing this anemia. You should advocate for yourself, of course. Thank you, doctor. No problem. Do you want to go back to your slide before yes. I pose uh, another was, question I, from you? That was you? the question about the flatulence, and says, I think uh, uh, that somebody asked. And this is how to keep, as I mentioned, how to keep your colon as healthy as possible. Um, as we mentioned, 25 to 30 grams of fiber a day, vegetables and fruits, uh, the supplement, avoiding red meats, avoiding sp uh, smoked meats, avoiding processed foods, uh, eating healthy. If you eat healthy, as I said, diet is very important because if you don't eat healthy, your whole body is going to be affected. Your whole gut is going to be affected and then your whole body. Drink a lot of water, exercise, no alcohol, no smoking, probiotics. The probiotics can help replenish your gut with the microbiome that is healthy rather than the ones that cause a lot of gas and flatulence. So that can help you too. So take once a day probiotics. Um, and as I said, if you don't need antibiotics, don't take them. Uh, it shouldn't be taking, taken unless need be. All right, Dr. Riyad, um, someone's asking, when you talk about red meats, are you including in that category pork and lamb? Yeah, pork is the worst, actually. I, I love pork, man. I love, <laughs> I love bacon, too. But all of that is not healthy, unfortunately. Like, I'm, I'm saying in moderation, and I do that myself. Like, I don't say I'm not going to eat it, period. Although I wish I can, but I can't. So I eat it in moderation. So I try to limit it to once a week, uh, maybe twice a week, but I don't depend on uh, ba bacon and red meats and smoked meats every single day. Pork is a red meat. So the white meats is fish. Those are the healthy meats. The fish, especially certain ones that are not very fatty. Um, and uh, turkey, chicken. Those are all healthier kinds of meat that you can depend on, on in your diet more than red meats. And this is part of the Mediterranean diet. Mediterranean diet is mainly based on fish with vegetables. So that's why it's healthier. Dr. Riyadh, should we be giving ourselves enemas? And if so, how often and what types? I remember there was a trend at one point about coffee enemas. Um, what, what's your feeling about those? I don't think it's necessary un unless need be. Um, uh, I tell patients that like severely constipated an enema can help, but for a short period of time. Some diseases, which is completely different discussion for um, for pouch patients and stuff like that, they might need enemas on a daily basis or uh, patients that have incontinence or something like that, but it shouldn't be on a daily basis for constipation. Um, I feel like if you change all of that, take stool softeners, walk, exercise, um, should be enough. If you need something else, an enema is something that you can do, but shouldn't be on a daily basis. All right. Thank you, Dr. Riyad. And uh, this is all the time we have. And uh, this has been a very interesting conversation. I'm sure we're helping some people today uh, with the knowledge that you shared, Dr. Riyad, uh, around colon health, and I'm just grateful to you for being here today. Um, I just want to remind everyone um, to look in the chat. There is information about the Yonkers Nork, um, the Crestwood Library, as well as how to contact Dr. Riyad if you'd like an appointment um, or a consult. Also, if you are in need of a physician, there is a phone number there um, that you can um, jot down or take a picture with your camera. We will be having more of these monthly presentations with the Yonkers Nork and uh, look forward to seeing you folks again. But before we sign off, I want to hand back, hand it back over to Valerie for final comments. Valerie. Thank you, Dr. Riyad, and thank you, Elisa. This was really wonderful. This gave so much information on, on stuff we just don't talk about enough. Thank you so much. I'm honored to be here. Thank you. Mm -hmm.